Excellent. Hi, everyone. I just popped up out of nowhere. Uh, my name is Jason Scott. Um, I am the proprietor of textfiles.com. I also have done a documentary on bulletin board systems called BBS the Documentary. Uh, about a year ago, I suddenly announced on my weblog that I was going to collect every podcast, which was a bit of an interesting way to put it. This got the attention of the uh, Boing Boing crowd, the Waxy crowd, the Slashdot crowd, and then eventually NPR called me. So I got interviewed about that. But all I was talking about was the fact that I was going to be collecting podcasts. And what was more important to me was not so much at the time that I was collecting podcasts, but I wanted to show people how a collection begins, which I think is an important thing because sometimes you find somebody who has every science fiction fanzine ever made and you go, how the hell did this happen? And why does this guy have every Hummel figurine? What happened? And so I said, okay, well, here's how it begins. And I do this and, you know, and just to go on that for a moment, my main point of that whole discussion was simply to say to people that there comes a time when you decide you want to collect something. When you have a lot of stuff, it's not very well uh, sorted. You end up with basically a huge pile of crap that is causing you a lot of bother and isn't the biggest. So nobody cares and you are basically wasting time on something that isn't the logical end of what you think you're supposed to be. So you have a bunch of baseball cards, but you don't have them all. You don't even have anywhere near them all, and yet you're spending a lot of time sorting baseball cards, so why are you doing it? And I said, that's the critical point. And it works out to about six months in, three to six months, where somebody says, why am I doing this? And then they dump it, and that's what shows up on eBay. And that's just the nature of collecting. So the question that came then was, why are you even collecting podcasts? What are so important about podcasts? And that's what got me on NPR, was describing the fact that one of the most important things about podcasts, as far as I'm concerned, is that I consider podcasts currently to be one of the best self-service anthropological studies currently going on. What you have is you have a large amount of people, self-selected, admittedly, who want to be heard, who are talking about usually themselves, or talking about the world around them in some sort of form that uh, puts their perspective on it. So what ends up happening is that unwittingly they capture a moment in time. So uh, when you think of podcasting, one of the first things that happens, instead of thinking of it as the, one of the most largest self-service anthropological whatever, is, uh, wow, I hate that word. And that's the biggest reaction I tend to get is, wow, I hate the word podcasting. And uh, the term podcasting was basically created by Adam Curry as a way to describe this process of distributing files. Basically gave it a cute name. And unfortunately, he chose a name that had a vague feeling attached to a brand of hardware. And in doing so, kind of uh, married it to it. You know, we, we might think of something as taping, but we don't think of something as max selling. And we don't think of you know, driving as fording because we just have these generic verbs. But unfortunately, podcasting has now been attached to the Apple iPod. This small, yeah, OK, everyone knows what it is. The thing that got the attention of people when podcasting was announced a couple years ago was a number of themes. One, that it was uh, an, a way for independent people who had very little commercial interest to describe things in a way they wanted to, and to play music in a way they wanted to. So that way, you were empowering the individual to distribute their voice around everywhere anyway. So the problem is, is uh, I, had my, I had a call from my father. And my father said, what the hell is this podcasting blog thing? And I said, well, every once in a while, a group of people with too much money and time get together and do something that other people have been doing but because they don't want to be associated with what it used to be and describe themselves as inventors, they give it a new name and a variation of a name and say they're doing that, which is so it's, it's I'm living plus. I'm, you know, it's not just I have this car, I have stripes on this car. So they tend to describe things in a different way. So for instance, I, you know, a lot of people hear of podcasting. I don't know if anyone's heard of the term pod fading yet. Um, pod fading is now the new term for when you stop doing podcasting. So there's actually a term now for not doing something. 
um, because not so much a case of they're trying to be weird, they're just simply trying to encapsulate an idea. So how far back does this idea go? And the answer is very far. Uh, if you want to stick with audio, you can certainly go back 100 years. Uh, so let's stick with audio. But there's a little bit to be said for the fact that uh, mimeograph, the ability to photocopy papers easily and send them out, contributes to this. But even before then, um, the advent of wireless radio was basically, initially, a way to sell things. It was a way to send out information to people without having to uh, you know, use phones, which at the time were extremely expensive for such a thing, and to, for the price of a transmitter, uh, get your message out. So one of the surprising things people don't know is that in the 20s uh, and early 30s, when the FCC did not exist in this fashion, there was kind of a free-for-all, a very exciting free-for-all, where basically anybody could say anything they wanted to on the air over anybody else. And in fact, a lot of these stations that came out were basically mom-and-pop operations. So you'd have a hardware store, and then you would have this gigantic fucking tower out the back of it with no real uh, you know, regulation as to how big it can be or what it's doing and how can they spray each other out. And so once they started to actually become regulated and illegal, they actually moved to Mexico and started to broadcast across the, you know, just literally cases where in rainstorms they would shoot out lightning because they get hit by things because they were just so much electricity being used to do this. So the idea that there was like kind of like a clean, fun, happy-go-lucky radio of high quality and then it kind of turned into crap is not entirely true. However, it is worthwhile to notice the trend that radio took. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about ham radio and shortwave. We'll stick with the idea of commercial radio because commercial radio was the first case of a medium where they were trying to present to you an experience, either through, through news or through music or through whatever other uh, political information they wanted to get across. And the potential of a medium like that is very huge and is what really excites people when they hear about it. Of course, the first thing they find out is how much it costs and startup costs. And startup costs are what kills you in this kind of a medium. When you want to broadcast to people, when you want to let a lot of people know something, the rule has always been, wow, that's really expensive. That's an extremely expensive proposition. You can, you can spend literally tens of thousands of dollars to get a license for the right to be able to broadcast. So what ends up happening? is, did you lose me? Good, no you didn't. So what ends up happening is um, you end up with a few small stations that end up in any particular town. Um, and as a result, those stations, to encourage advertisers to be able to sustain their costs, end up having to make certain shortcuts. Now none of this should be news to you. I mean, this is just the basic concept of commercial media. But it's important to note because what happens is that whenever a new media shows up, whenever a new way of broadcasting or a new way of getting your message out comes out, the first thing that anybody who's promoting it wants you to know about is how you are not encumbered by the previous incarnation of the media's weight. You're, you don't have to worry about you know, this regulation and you don't have to worry about advertisers and you don't have to do this. So isn't that great? Now that only sustains itself for very long. Uh, there's, there's a good example in uh, cable where, you know, cable was commercial free. And that may predate some people in the room, but cable was commercial free. The idea was, since you were paying money for this infrastructure to be ins installed, you didn't have any commercials, right? Well, that's not the case anymore. Uh, now it's this huge... So when I hear that satellite radio is commercial free and wasn't that great, and that's why you want to buy in, it's like, yeah, that's good, see you in 2015. So when people hear uh, about a new medium for themselves, and by that I mean there's people who want to get a message out, and actually I should separate that out. There's two different kinds of people in the world, right? Consumers and producers. Sometimes people are a little bit of both, but you know, there are people who are not interested in making anything. They just want to have whatever they get be the best. So they don't really care about how it was made, just as long as it's good. So 
Uh, this is part of the reason why MP3s took off so well, because it was more important that you were getting all this great stuff, less than how much it cost or if it was costing anybody or any of the other rules that came by. So when you're a producer, you want to get your message out, and that's uh, sometimes an extremely heartbreaking and involved process. You work very hard to make something. You often don't have the resources that other people do. And when you do, it goes to a relatively small audience. So um, moving back into time, the natural process that would happen once the FCC moved in, regulations kicked in, it was a certain amount of money to broadcast, was the advent of pirate radio. Now this is done a variety of ways with pirate radio. Uh, one of the ways that people would do it was simply to broadcast for short periods of time in towns that they were living in as fast as possible and then disappear again. So when you were listening, you'd basically look for a place on the band that wasn't being used, and you would have your own little transmitter that you whipped up. And if you were smart, you had it pre-recorded. Um, earlier times, it was a little harder, but you know, you know, had to do reel-to-reel -reel versus anything else. But you wanted to pre-record it because then you could mount your little thing on the back of a truck and kind of drive around town until your tape ran out and then disappear again. Uh, the FCC went through different phases with this, uh, up to and including some raids and fines and seizures, depending on a number of political factors. Uh, sometimes they just simply warned people, and other times they tried to put them in jail. Pirate radio stations, however, um, there's kind of a vision, this kind of swashbuckling impression of somebody running around and pump up the volume and all that stuff. And where that all, you know, kind of meets reality is that there were actually a wide variety of pirate radio stations, and there are still a few today, where you might get a bunch, I mean, if you're putting yourself at risk, which is the inherent energy that comes from pirate radio, if you're putting yourself at risk, you say, well, what do you want to broadcast? That would, I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense for you to have a pirate radio station and you sound like the local clear channel. You want to be different, so either you're profane, because that's not allowed. You play music that doesn't get any play anywhere because either nobody wants to listen to it or it's so rare nobody can get their hands on it. You put out viewpoints that you consider to be unusual and that will never get any play. This goes for both um, positive messages of trying to change the world and negative ones of wanting to round up people and kill them. Uh, you have viewpoints that you think aren't being met on a pure political scale where you might say, well, because of this doctrine, this local station won't play anything by my libertarian group, so we're going to come on with speeches from our people, and we're going to tell you about it, and nobody can stop us, and with that little extra energy. Again, all of this stuff is this inherent human need to communicate and get your message out, and that's what gets fed on, and because of the nature of commercial radio, the nature of a commercial medium where you have a large amount of cost below, and then the cost of getting it out to that many people. I mean, there's prices that are paid for that. That are, you know, there's, there's, there's not just a cost in terms of um, the equipment, you know, of a network, but there's also the cost of people, of having to send people out to make sure everything's where it should be, people are buying what they should, people are licensing what they should. I mean, it's this huge infrastructure, which is why the three networks of television lasted for so long. Um, so, if you're going along with this as I said, a uh, um, low, infra low cost infrastructure of pirate radio, you're basically, you better be putting out this little message that you think nobody's going to get. Without that little bit of oomph, what's the point? Now, pirate radio, which, like I said, has lasted up through the modern era, uh, had a few points where it got particularly famous. Uh, one of the most famous was the fact that there was one pirate radio station that put itself on a boat outside of New York City and broadcast into New York, and was eventually raided. Um, but that whole concept, right, I mean, of a radio station on a boat broadcasting to one of the biggest cities in the world, and eventually they come and they take them away and arrest everybody for having this radio station is an extremely romantic ideal. Again, all of this uh, is a part of podcasting in its own way, because podcasting this new idea, quote unquote, has to feed off of all this old romantic ideal. Now, MP3s, this fully licensed uh, proprietary format that was essentially 
swiped, um, had been around since the late 80s, but it wasn't very effective. Uh, in 1988 was when they first got MP3s to work, but it took three days to encode one second. So the processing power just simply wasn't there to be able to use these for anything. It's not till the mid 90s that we, uh, when, when MP3, the MP3, MPEG-1 layer 3 audio format is encoded by machines to be played on uh, anything playing MPEG-1 that somebody had the bright idea of, well, why don't I just strip away that encoding mechanism and produce MP3s? And what you got was one megabyte a minute, which is enormously smaller. I mean, but in 1995, you're still talking about a case where a 10 to 20 megabyte hard drive is not an unseen thing. So there's this interesting side effect. Because MP3s were proprietary, uh, owned by the Fraunhofer group, um, the fact that they were going out was a, a pure illegal act. The fact that you had an MP3 that you had encoded, unless you used software that had licensed it, was technically illegal uh, because you were using unlicensed technology to do this. However, it was so friggin' cool and it was such a killer app that people just pulled onto it and MP3s start to pull around. This drives increased hard drive space needs, increased bandwidth needs, and increased machine power needs. So in a way, this need to hear sound drives this computer industry even further. Right? I mean, as soon as people say, well, it's not playing them loud enough, or I need more space for my music, or I need to be able to rip these things, that drives it. So there's always this positive aspect. Well, MP3s, um, the industry had been creating digital music now since the late 80s. They had been creating it for compact discs, 16-bit waves that would go onto this piece of plastic. Uh, and of course, like we said, the waves were so large that to transfer them wasn't a very realistic idea. But transferring something that was a megabyte a minute, eh, you could put the machine away for a day. So we get to this late 90s, MP3s are now being traded, and people are recording shows to distribute. Now, there are shows, uh, the most common hacker show that people think of is Off the Hook, which has predecessors. I mean, there's predecessors to Off the Hook. There's a 70s show that I have that talks about phone freaking and so on. I mean, these, these, these exist for some time. Um, but the way that Off the Hook was being distributed was on a publicly owned or a public, publicly aimed radio station, WBAI in New York, uh, which uh, Emmanuel Goldstein was recording a show on. Now, so the idea was he was recording this show that was being broadcast to such a large group of people, a few million people, the idea was it would reach this audience in an interesting way and people would hear it who didn't expect it and the idea is cross-pollination of these hacking ideas. Pro or con, people might have for his positions, his theory was correct. By giving himself a weekly area to speak in his own voice and provide voices immediately, anytime there was any kind of controversy involving, for instance, uh, Rusty and Edie's BBS, which was a BBS seized for pirating in the early 90s, or Kevin Paulson or Kevin Mitnick, it's one thing to describe in your magazine about what these people are talking about, but another one entirely to have them on the show and speak in their own voice. There's something very powerful about the human voice. So uh, Emmanuel was very correct in getting his ideas across by using this medium. However, there's something to be said for the fact that producing a good radio show is not as obvious as it might seem. For instance, when I was being recorded for NPR, I was being recorded in the studio with Christopher Lydon and another guest. However, there were 10 other people involved in the process. He had two people whose jobs were simply to take in phone calls to try to figure out who they were going to get. They had one person who had several people on the phone who they called ahead of time to keep on the phone in case we slowed down. And Christopher Lydon had a doppelganger, a producer, who was listening to what he was saying and sending him messages across a little uh, screen, which in the old days they would use pieces of paper, that basically said, 
go this way, go this way, go this way, or this person's on the phone and ready to go when you are, and so on. So when, a, when you hear a person speak like that, you have to realize that radio works in the invisible. Radio works by hiding things. So it tries to convince you that it's one person or that nothing is going wrong because they're just so good at it, but the answer is no, they're, they're blowing a lot of people behind the scenes to do this. So uh, when, I, when I hear modern shows and it's just a guy, and they wonder why it sounds a certain way. When I record a show myself, when I do one of my own shows, I record myself and then I pop it into an editor and then I make myself smart. Um, because I know that I'm fighting up against an infrastructure, so I don't consider it cheating. Um, the important thing is the information gets across. Um, so, by the late 90s, with the advent of MP3, a number of shows are coming out. And by that I mean there are people who are recording uh, conventions who are recording um, uh, you know, music that they like, uh, who are recording basically talking with other people, and they're putting them online for people to download, which is relatively clunky. Uh, one of the reasons, one of the only reasons why fucking real media even got a foothold on anything was because it introduced this idea of easy streaming. Uh, the fact that it was relatively good and the fact that it worked so that you didn't have to put a full file and have people download it just not to use it, as opposed to downloading just enough that they want to listen to before they get bored to save bandwidth, and allowing you to track it and allowing you to charge people to use it, provided all these services. They saw this. This is also, I might add, the advent uh, in the late 90s of push technology, which was a welcome flash in the pan. And push technology was a way of reimagining the internet so that it became television again. Idea being that most people don't wish to produce their own content, so providing them with all these tools to produce their own content is a bit of a waste and, a lack and, and, and allows for uh, an, it's basically an opening so that you can commercialize it by saying to somebody, you don't have to waste your time creating new content or looking for it, we'll give it back to you. This was exciting enough that Netscape and Microsoft both bought into it and purchased smaller companies that sort of involved themselves in this technology to become evangelicals to produce this stuff. So while a part of a lot of people, and this is important, when people hear this, certain people go, well, that makes sense. I don't mind turning my internet to channel three and being ready to watch all day. Other people say, wow, that's a blasphemy of what the net was designed for. And that division is very important because that division will continue uh, to the present day, especially as bandwidth increases and you're able to basically emulate television. I mean, what happens when you can basically get full screen television coming about as fast as you expect it to in TV in the future? Will people just stop producing their own content or will they want to kind of just pounce into these preformed uh, channels. So that dichotomy of both being consumers and being producers just gets stronger as the technology matures. You know, when you start out with a technology, you kind of have to self-start. You have to be able to understand it enough to be able to get onto the net. I mean, certainly we've come a long way from trying desperately to figure out how settings work in DOS so that the TCP IP stack works to repair my network. Um, you know, this is just a manifestation of, 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 of consumers increasing to the point where you have people who aren't technically involved in a process. So with the shows being available, they were available, but they had to be found and downloaded. And more importantly, you had to go back and check again to see if they had changed the content. Now, that fundamental need by you as the consumer to go out and seek things was the big uh, stumbling point in late 1990s internet experience as far as content producers were concerned. Uh, why would you want to keep checking this site? Oh, nothing's changed. This also causes people to want to do anything they can to change their content every single day, even if it's a minute amount, just so you'll keep coming back and look at the ads. So this is kind of what pushes weblogging into the forefront. I mean, certainly weblogs exist long before the word weblog or blog. But the idea that there's software that would just change things far enough. Now, um, in association with the Netscape site, um, 
a standard comes out based on XML called really simple syndication. I don't want to kill everybody. I'm not going to go into the full history of RSS because like anything else that's monetized, it's now a huge controversy as to who did what when. And it's just a waste of time to talk about it. What it comes down to is a number of people at the same time thought, wow, you know, it would be good if you could just check a small file and see if the, if the website has changed at all. And if it has, send different to the person and they can evaluate it. That's the basic concept behind really simple syndication. All of these variations, Atom, uh, RSS2, and so on, I mean, these are all basically the same idea. You have a small file that represents the contents of a website in a small enough package that a bunch of people can hit it and be able to go, oh, oh, something new happened, and then alert themselves. Um, it basically turns, again, things into a channel. You basically have a case of what's new on TV today. And for that small loss of um, control over you know, going out and finding things yourself, you get to spread yourself out much further. So in some ways, it's extremely powerful. In some ways, it's limiting because you start to think of every website as simply a linear set of new events that happen. Same thing with podcasts. You tend to think of them as singular files. And what's the new show today as opposed to what happened before? Whatever happened before is useless. It's a rerun. Who wants to learn about that? So that's the danger of it. That's always the danger of it. Um, so uh, just so that... Any talk about podcasting by law has to mention enclosures. Um, basically, podcasts are enclosures within RSS feeds. They're basically, there's a way to declare in an RSS feed, today's entry includes this file. Please download this file. And so uh, that file can really be anything. It can be a zip. It can be a quick time. It can be an MP3 or an OG or whatever. So basically, when you hit this file, you can have a client program, in this case iPodder, BashPodder, uh, iTunes, you know, oh, here's the new thing, I think I'll grab it, download it, and then play it. What Adam Curry pushed was the idea that you had a show, and the show was new, and by having this client that used this technology to figure out what was new, it would, in the background, download it and get around the bandwidth issue. Because one of the problems with internet bandwidth as it currently is, is, wow, look at that cool pirated game. Wow, that cool pirated game is 1.2 gigabytes. I won't be able to have it right now. I'm sad. I will smoke a doobie. <laughs> so what ends up happening is that you want to set things going. So the idea is your computer kind of knows what you want next, and so overnight it's downloading the new stuff. And uh, obviously, you know, as time goes on, people combined technology. So obviously now there's a way to say, well, instead of just downloading it, let me BitTorrent it. So you can say, well, here's the new thing. I'm gonna, here's the new where. I'm going to download it via BitTorrent, and it'll let me know when I'm finished. Uh, this has certain parties in apoplexy. But that idea is pretty, I mean, that's a, it's a fundamental, it's just a fundamental human need to want their stuff to come to them as easy as possible. And if it's a little bit of extra effort to do it, as long as it's a, a, a concentrated effort, as long as it's, if I work a little bit harder now and get this thing or pay this money and it's a little easier for me from now on, I'll do it. You know, that's, you know, the, the, you know just the idea behind I'm going to buy a little bit better equipment now because it will save me all this pain later. People do that, right? So the idea with these clients is, okay, if I download this client and I understand it just enough to get to these feeds, great, I'll do this from now on. So uh, Curry encouraged people to use these clients to download these files onto their iPod. The idea being that the next day you'd have your five new shows uh, about any number of subjects and then you would listen to them as if they were new shows, and they had just appeared that day, which for you they probably did, and uh, you could hear it. Now his show was the Daily Source Code, and again, Adam Curry, I mean, you know, Adam Curry was one of the first MTV uh, VJs. He had been involved in broadcasting one way or another for about 20, 25 years by that point. I mean, he's not as pretty as he used to look, but he's a hardened, you know, showman a hardened entertainer who knows how to piece a show together. 
So when people hear him and they're inspired to do it themselves, they forget that there's a quarter century of experience behind each and every show. Um, well, these podcasts, many of which initially already existed in other formats, uh, had already been available in these downloadable forms, started to say, well, I do podcasting too. I produce this show with an RSS feed. So they start to expand. Now, that brings up an interesting question. What is a podcast uh, in that way? Because when I told people that I was going to download every podcast, the initial response was, you're full of shit, you can't. And the answer is, I can't. Simply because what people consider podcasts now are completely out of range. The way that I download every podcast, by the way, is that I took a program called Bash Potter, which is essentially a bash script that knows how to take an XML file and parse out the enclosures, and it pulls down every enclosure that's new from a feed. And I simply give it thousands of feeds, and they come down. And so I have this machine that is downloading podcasts 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and I have a second set of routines that burn them out to DVD-ROMs for storage. So I have like a terabyte and a half of them now or something like that. Something like five or six years worth of audio. Um, and I have something on the order of six to 7,000 shows. So I go through these shows and you go, well, what, what are most of these shows? And most of these shows are, hey, I'm humping my laptop for two hours. You know, essentially it's just, I'm going to play these 20 MP3 files to you for the next hour and a half and I'm Candy Striper Radio, or whatever the hell his name is. You know, a lot of people, given this technology, their initial response is, dude, listen to what I just heard today. Which, you know, uh, was interesting in the beginning because at the early time of streaming audio, of shoutcast, of real media, it was very much up in the air what the legality of this was. You know, radio stations pay money to play music. And that's not always obvious to people because of this hidden infrastructure, but there is a complicated set of payment schemes, ASCAP, BMI, that track what you play and come in and charge based on that. So that was kind of lost. It's not really known, so it's kind of lost on people streaming music. So for a while, it wasn't exactly clear, well, is this legal? And the person would say, well, I'm not giving it to them. I'm just streaming it to them. They can't keep it. And then, of course, stream rippers come out. So everyone gets it uh, automatically named. So the technology is going fast and fast. And then there's the problem that radio stations began to stream and call themselves podcasts. And this got uh, actors involved because an actor gets paid for performing in a commercial and gets residuals based on how many times that commercial is played. What happens if it's played over the streaming radio? And the answer is, you gotta pay for that. And then, it got involved because, unlike radio, where they have to kind of estimate your listeners, they know how many listeners you have. You have two. And so the answer was, well, for every listener you get, which we know you know, you have to pay this amount of money, which was, if you calculated it out, the difference between dirt and champagne at how much it was costing you per listener. So a lot of radio stations that were streaming said, well, we can't afford to really keep streaming this kind of stuff if we're going to have to pay this amount of stuff. And, and this became a, a huge debate and, uh, the, the, you know, the outcome is at best murky. There are a bunch of rules based on how much money you make if you make less than uh, 10000 or 20000 I forget the cutoff, for you being a private individual, and then you can play things. But on the other hand, if you're just streaming somebody else's full music and that's your podcast, there's some debate as to whether or not you should be paying or not. So the question is, well, what do you think is a podcast? And I think a podcast is one more where a person is providing original content. The original content can be musical, or it can be spoken, or it can be interviews, or it can be recordings, but you're, pro you're, you're producing this content and then you're producing it. And actually what I've discovered is that the number of people doing that is actually extremely small. Not many more than a few hundred at any given time are really doing that. Uh, most shows I find last about three months, three to six months unless they are an already extant thing being transferred onto the internet. For instance, sermons. 
I have a lot of sermons. So these sermons were being recorded every week and being put on the local AM station every week. So it was painless for them to put it up on a podcast. So I learn about the glory of God every week too. So there's also ones where people are producing news uh, for the purposes of some organization. Well, they put it online for other people to hear. And so that kind of stuff is interesting because they're just transferring it to a new medium. To them, podcasts are just another mimeograph. There's no meaning to it. They're not like, wow, we reach all these other people. It's just, oh, here's a cheaper way to broadcast this stuff so people can just grab it again. Uh, there are podcasts on wine. There are podcasts on movies. There are podcasts on politics. I've heard podcasts on kind of esoteric subjects that maybe five people care about, but I've also heard podcasts that in many ways try to ape commercial radio and say, well, we're going to produce this kind of, uh, we're going to do tech TV, but it's going to be me, and I'm smart. And, you know, a couple years ago, I became aware of this movement of hacker radio that I could trace the lineage from a radio show called Geeks in Space in Slashdot, where leveraging off their massive audience, the creators of Slashdot would record themselves talking about crap and then would put it up and it would have a lot of people download it because it's Slashdot, but it was crap. They did it for about a year and then they got bored and they stopped. This inspired other shows with a technological bent and a hacker bent. And then you end up with um, a hacker media movement, representatives of which are here at Nauticon. But what it really is, is it's a bunch of people inspired by other people along a certain lineage to say, wow, I can say anything I want to, and I can describe these things to people, and isn't that exciting? But it takes a certain kind of person to think that they want to do it by speaking it, especially in the technological field, which does not encourage people to talk to each other as if pronouncing ideas. They like conversations, and they like uh, non audio-visual interaction, with the exception of conventions. <laughs> um, so in some ways it's interesting to hear these because they kind of go against the nature of the personality type that usually does it. So you end up with kind of this interesting kind of a mix of a person who has to be technically able and also sound good. You know, one of the reasons that um, you know, David Letterman, who was just this ugly bastard, got so much, uh, you know, he they tried a couple shows with him. I mean, you know, before Late Night with David Letterman, there was, there was an afternoon with David Letterman, and there was a morning show with David Letterman. And so why are these shows constantly trying to get David Letterman to get on the air? And the answer was because was they could tell that David Letterman had a relationship with the camera, where when he stood in front of the camera and started to talk about anything, you kind of wanted to keep watching him. He had a certain magical sense, a certain ability to handle the camera that only comes along every once in a while. And they were like, we're just going to keep plugging this engine in until it takes off. And that's why David Letterman continues to this day and can continue as long as he wants and was able to switch major networks on a whim was because they knew that. And that quality is very hard to find. And that's one of the things that podcasts have to keep in mind. The number of people who can be that engaging is very small, and sometimes they lack other personality aspects, like being smart, or being able to speak for long periods of time without prompting, which is why you'll have a lot of people who look very good and are very engaging on the screen, and you realize that as soon as they try to um, improvise in any way, they fall flat, because they're being brought in for a certain quality. So finding somebody who's kind of that Renaissance feeling, somebody who both knows their subject and is very engaging, is very rare, and also to have the energy to keep producing stuff day after day, as opposed to one or two really good shows. One of the things I always encourage people who I have watched a lot of podcasts from is to consider making their shows limited, you know, five to ten episodes, and then plot them all out and then do them. And if you want to do another series, give it a new name. And because what happens is you get this case of after the 15th or 20th show, people are just, I, why? I, oh. You know, Every title of every show starts to begin with, I'm sorry about the delay. 
I'm sorry I haven't gotten back to you in a month because it slows down. Now, where's podcasting going? Where's podcasting going to be in the future? Now, I can't imagine that the name podcasting is going to last much longer. I don't give it much more than a few years before it becomes something else, becomes a different term. People might use the term podcast, but they'll be using it kind of willy-nilly, and it'll kind of melt into our language. I think you're just going to hear other terms for it, or show, or I have a show, or whatever. This podcast idea will go away. But this already extant urge by people to communicate, of people to let other people know about what they're working on, about letting people know about something that they don't hear otherwise, will continue and is a, just a fundamental part of the communication mediums that are out there. So, you know, as long as we have human communication, we're going to have podcasts. It's going to be a different name. And the other answer is, uh, you know, the other question is, what, how do I, do I think a person should do a podcast? You know, you, you hear about these things, and do you want to do them? And my answer is, it doesn't hurt to try, especially now. Um, in today's era, you can set up your own way to record yourself pretty cheaply, something on the range of 10 bucks for a mic. You won't sound very good, but you'll know after the first recording whether or not you want to do this or not, and it's worth it to try. So uh, whether or not you want to set up a whole domain name about your great show and get all your art in place and get your episode list all ready and then start recording, I don't suggest that. But, you know, one of the really miraculous things that has occurred in the last 10 years, certainly in the last 10 years, definitely in the last five, is this amazing drop in the cost of producing media. You know, it, it had been going down for a long time. The difference between having to have something sent out to the printers to have it offset print and to have things separated by color so that you could print it and you'd have to have a minimum 1,000 run to today where you print full color, laid out things, and then crumple them up because you were off by a centimeter <laughs> is an astounding thing and can't be stressed enough. The fact that you can now buy one terabyte disks, which are actually, of course, a couple disks put together, but the fact that you can just purchase this, that you can buy 200 or 300 gigabyte drives, $50 on special, you know, this amazing stretch of media, uh, just, it's, it's worth it. It's worth it to jump into it. Uh, I always encourage people, you know, right now we're doing what some people would call a podcast. We're doing not a con radio in the other room. Not a con radio is a bunch of schmucks with a microphone yeah. <laughs> and aiming themselves at a stream and recording themselves and adding to the nature of communication. When we did this last year, it was an amazing success. And it was an amazing success because it was such an interesting variety of people who we just threw onto a microphone, some who had never been on a microphone before in that way, and just talking. And we produced something on the order of, I think, 13 hours of stuff. Just beautiful discussions, some of them profane, some of them wondrous, some of them horrible, but all of them real and all of them just people, stuff you wouldn't normally hear on the air. So it was, it was beautiful, and that's why we're doing it again this year. We're going to do it all through the weekend, just recording, and we encourage people to stop by and make it so I don't have to be on the air and just, you know, be a part of this, try it out. So anyway, I guess... If there's one thing I want people to come away from, is that the history of podcasting is the history of communication. Podcasting is just another name for communicating. So the history of podcasting, it's long indeed. And the future of podcasting, also long indeed. All right, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> are, there, are there any questions, just very quickly, like, why are you still on the stage? Nope. All right, I answered every single question. Excellent. That's the best speech. Oh, one other piece of technology. Currently, right now, I am wired, wireless for them, wireless for myself across here. So life is getting cooler by the minute, isn't it? That's just neat shit. So anyway, just wanted to pass that along because, you know, it's, it's a technology conference. Anyway, thank you very much for your time.
Oh, Question. oh, you in the in the bright sun. Yes. Um, okay. So you see, if you're, since you've got the two wireless um, mics, <laughs> is one of them going to Not Account Radio right now? No. Okay. Because I wanted them to get started on broadcasting stuff. Um, I can take my show, actually, which is currently being recorded on this PMM 655 Marantz recorder, which yeah. is recording it directly to Wave. Hook it up by USB and start broadcasting on Nauticon Radio as soon as I walk out of here. So technology is cool, isn't it? Um, there's a lot of cool stuff out there, but it has to, you have to have something that you're talking about. <laughs> you, have to, you know, they, things are getting better and better, but you know, the real future is content. Anyway, basic stuff. All right, anything else? Anything? Okay. What time is it, by the way? About five of. Five of? Yeah. You didn't give me my warning. You were being nice. That's what I just came over to do. Okay, just checking. <laughs> All right. Man, that's bright. All right, thank you, everyone. Uh, a little bit later, we're going to have uh, Wait, Wait, Don't Pwn Me. I'm in that. And so stick around for that fun and enjoy the mayhem and enjoy Nauticon, please.